Let's move to our next session. I would like to invite Efren Haley from Microsoft. If you don't mind, Efren, to enable your video and voice. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today. A couple of things before I introduce you, uh, Efren, and, and obviously you're going to take us through Microsoft's own journey on modern project production, right? I think the stories that you're going to bring to our audience are obviously real stories. You, people are going to be able to see what exactly Microsoft is doing, how you're approaching it. But what is also important to highlight is that Microsoft has been involved in several PPI efforts for, for several years. And so on behalf of PPI, thank you, Efren and Microsoft, for your ongoing involvement and, and your openness to, to share what you're doing, what you're learning in, in, uh, with, with the entire global engineering and construction industry. So that being said, let me uh, say a few more things about you. Efren is the principal at Microsoft and he's responsible for Microsoft implementation of project production management for the global data center build and lease programs. Efren has a broad experience, including leadership positions in engineering, manufacturing, footprint strategy, design for manufacturability, and supply chain. Prior to joining Microsoft, Efren worked for a worldwide manufacturer of lifting, material handling of and cranes for a variety of industries, including construction. <clears throat> to finish, Efren is a, an expert in lean production systems and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from University of Saskatchewan. So hopefully you got that one right. And without uh, further ado, so it's over, over to you, uh, Efren. So let me stop, my, 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 stop sharing my screen and you can proceed. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Roberto. Yeah, Saskatchewan. I don't know, most of you have heard of Saskatchewan. It's a province in uh, central Canada. All right, so yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for the introduction, Roberto. Um, happy to participate in this process. Just before we get going, I just want to say that we've been working with SPS now since 2018. So, you know, it's been some time. It's been some, it's, it is a good partnership, I will say. The journey continues, you know, it's been a tremendous learning from my side and Microsoft side. Hopefully it's a little bit on the SPS side as well, in terms of what we do in data. You know, but I don't want to say that we're done learning, you know, so there's no complacency here. It's a continuous improvement process as the journey continues. So what am I going to be talking about a little bit is, you know, what, what have you been doing since, you know, our initial engagement with SPS, let's say in 2018, you know, how does that, how, how does that engagement involve in terms of what are we doing with production planning, how we think of production planning when we're building data center, which is, you know, most of you probably think of it as a construction activity and not necessarily a manufacturing process activity. So how, how does that journey involve? What have we been doing? And then in terms of involvement, what I'm talking about is how we start over time, we, we, you know, we start introducing digitizations, how we can, you know, in terms of continuous improvement, how we can collect data to production planning to, to harness improvement. What are the opportunities, you know, data and demand. So it's going to be, but basic production planning application. Todd talked about a little bit earlier in his presentation in terms of, you know, understanding the impact of variability, the cycle time, the variability throughput, you know, what is the optimal whip? So I'll talk a little bit about different aspects of, of production planning in the construction space. I will also talk a little bit about, you know, production planning is not necessarily, at least from my perspective, is not, it doesn't have limited application, let me put it this way. What I mean by that is it's not just used in a construction or physical movement, construction or assembly of a car or whatever. It could also be used for, for craft work, in other words, but can also be used in knowledge work, right? So, you know, the, the in knowledge work, what I mean by that is if you're, let's say, executing a contract, if you're doing a design engineering, you know, there is the end product is a finished design, right? But along the way, there is an assembly, there is a process that happens. So you can still use aspects of production planning to maintain, to understand what's going on in that, in that production system that is knowledge system. 
And then thirdly, I sorry will touch. To, sorry to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your screen. Sorry about that. My, you should, I'm you? not sharing anything yet. Okay, just checking with you. Thank I'm you. Just, sorry. I'm just kind of introducing the subject, and then thirdly, I will be talking about you know scenarios of modeling what if analysis. Okay, with that, I'll share my screen. Let me know when you see it. We can see it now. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, modern production planning is is a it's a it's a it's a title of of the of the presentation. So, so the question is, can you see the 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 presentation fine? Yes, we can see it very well. Please proceed. Okay. Great. So. So the first, like I said earlier, I, I, I hopefully I, I did a decent job of setting it up. You know, data centers are critical to us, to our business, right? So what I mean by that is there's, you know, there's a significant demand. And so we want to make sure there is a predictable, you know, supply to that demand. So I will be talking about how we do that in this, in this presentation, you know, and there's a very high level of complexity, obviously, in uh, that obviously in 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 the build of data center by complexity, you know, there's going to be equipment manufacturing, there's construction activities, there is network, there's a lot going on. So how it's a very dynamic space, you know? So the idea is how do you get a handle on all of that? You know, so to use the lean language, you know, you know, most of you have heard of it, just go do the Gemba, which means go to the go to the site don't be you know remotely trying to manage everything to a computer or stuff so go to the production system understand the physical movement see what's going on and then you can start better understanding what's going on in the system and you can start you know hopefully deploying production planning so so what are we doing uh this is the three things that i talked about the first one synchronized data center with equipment supply it's specifically talking about uh, the construction of data center, physical building. So quite a bit about that. And then, like I said, I will touch on, I talked about craft work versus knowledge work. So that's the central piece, the middle line, which is control and improve production planning in the global lease, lease program. So that's that. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then on the end, I'll talk about, you know, how can you do modeling of systems before you actually build something to ask key pertinent question for you to, to have better understanding before you start spending capital and, and, and investment in that sort of stuff. So going back to data center, I said this complex, this hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea what I mean by complex. So the, the chart on the left or the graph on the left, graphics on the left, if you will, is trying to illustrate you can have multiple supplies of equipment that go into a data center. Each one of those supplies in of the circles can be multiple suppliers, global or regional suppliers. And they're essentially manufacturing the equipment, hopefully in a just-in-time basis, which we'll talk about, and they're delivering to multiple data centers. They're everywhere. So pretty, so in terms of flow of material, you have very complex movement of activity. There's a dance going on. So somehow you want to be able to 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 manage that the flow of that so we can have a more you know a controller with you know predictable delivery and then the right you know obviously the red red blue and green colors you can think of them each one of them being multiple equipments so this is maybe see it could be a it's a constraint network or process diagram whatever terminology you want to use let's say from the start you know of a construction process to build a data center. So baking underground foundation work all the way to lights are blinking, servers are working and we start using it. So it's pretty complex. You can see there is a multiple lines going on all over the place, you know, and so, but you know, we're met, we're with SPS, we were able to design the process and, and, and have some predictability and understand what's going on in the system. But you know, production planning, it's all about there's basic foundations. These are four elements to it, right? There is you go to model. So I talked about Gamba or go to the site. What does that mean? It's going to, you know, equipment manufacturer or a construction process and talk with the manufacturing with, with the production people experts and and mapping the process, capture critical data in terms of you know inventory levels, 
lead time of long lead equipment, uh, manufacturing process of assembly work or fabrication work, whatever that is, have a full understanding of that process. And by the way, we're not, you know, our goal is not to tell the suppliers or, or someone else how to do their work. They're the subject matter expert. What we want to do though is we want to understand, you know, how their production system work, have some key understanding of some critical data, then we can kind of we begin to control the delivery, the production of this equipment into our data center. That's the objective. So you do that and then we configure it, which means, you know, in simple terms, uh, you know, like I said, we're not um, trying to get a pretty detailed process of the manufacturing process. That's not our objective. So we configure that to understand what are the critical elements of, of this production system that we want to control, that we want to configure it with the bigger construction standard process so then we can have a synchronicity in terms of you know supply demand and how the whole thing is going to flow and deploy essentially means we're now where we have a production planning that is going on on a weekly basis with that we're we're, um, we're collecting data as there and once you have enough critical data that you can start understand what's going on you can do the improvement which is you know you can have different analytics which is telling you how the system is behaving, how the production system is behaving, what can you do, what you can and cannot do about it, what are the risks, you know, and so on. This is an interesting chart. So what I'm trying to show you here is that, you know, the impact of demand and variability, right? So, you know, we talked about a little bit about, you know, variability earlier on, how variability, you know, most people think that may have negative impact on, on on production systems but in my mind there is there is good variability and there is not so good variability the key here what a, what a good variability what i mean is you know we, we we should understand that demand is not flat right so demand for for many reasons you might want to accelerate a delivery or something or you might want to delay something you live in a dynamic world things happen and so the key what i uh, this chart is to understand to know you know when you have variability in demand do you understand what's going on? What are the cascading effect of the entire value stream of the process? And what can you do about it? So this is from a demand perspective, but you can have similar behavior, impact and variability from a supply perspective. You know, as you recall earlier, I talked about is synchronizing production supply with demand. So we wanna make sure we understand demand variability, supply variability, what are the risk elements? How do you understand the data and what do you do? About So, so we talked about, you know, the, the modeling, the deploying, the configuring, the, you know, and then we, the improvement piece. In terms of the improvement piece, this is where we, we started to, uh, to have, to use Microsoft, you know, obviously, you know, this is, a, we, we use Power BI. Hopefully most of you have heard about it. It's a tool where we can have developed different data, graphics and analytics to understand what's going on with the system, what's going on with the production system. What we're trying to show in here is that there is a specific application for production manager for SPS. And there's also a specific application purpose for Power BI. The purpose of production management is to, to, to conduct production planning, to understand system level behaviors, to understand what are the risks, how do you how do you mitigate the risk? All of this activity happen in the space of SPS production manager. But we can also have BI where you can, we can design different dashboards on demand. Anybody with an organization can go and take a look at what's going on. And, you know, we can slice and dice data in many different ways, high level, you know, portfolio level, like a micro minute level, where you, you understand what's going on and you can start making decisions. And by the way, the data is refreshed every two hours because we have production planning going on globally you know, different types of the week. So, so the data has to be refreshed. So when I say dynamic on demand, that means hopefully the data you're looking at the BI is only two hours old. So, so having said all that, you know, in, in terms of the build, the construction, so what? So what does all this mean? You know, so there has been, like I said earlier, there has been some learnings, right? And so we'll touch on a little bit about what are, what are the learning, learnings, if you will. Equipment supply, the first one, you know, equipment supply lead times are excessive and, and overstated. And maybe Roberta can touch on earlier. 
things he when we met early in 2018, he was like, okay, what's the definition of lead time? How you know when you have this long line that says this is the lead time, how much of it is actual manufacturing, how much of it is long line of equipment, and how much of it is like the gray zone, the unknown, right? So typical supplies will tell you all lead time is X weeks, X months, X whatever. But once you get production planning and you and you start doing analytics and start looking at data, you begin to understand you know, how much is what, and then what is this gray zone? And then that's where the conversation you can have with the supplier or whoever to understand how much of that should you be maybe not accounted for, okay? And so, you know, I was talking about that. What is the effect on the business? I'm not gonna necessarily read every 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 bullet on this line and then what action you're taking. And the other critical importance is that, you know, I talked about synchronizing of equipment, right? To the delivery of data centers. So for us, what that means is, if you have, you know, a typical, you know, I don't want to necessarily, it's not a general statement, if you will, but typically, you know, in, in general contractor mode, they're going to want to have every equipment, whether they need it right now or not, right there sooner so they can look at it and fetch it. It gives, gives you a level of comfort, if you will. But in practical, you know, production flow system, you know, why do you want to have equipment sitting there? You know, some equipment may require, you know, humidity control may require some different ways of managing and handling it. You know, it's large pieces of equipment. There's double handling, you know, lots of stuff that can get on that can impact quality. So why about instead of just having a whole bunch of equipment sitting there months before it's needed, why not synchronize it? So have it, you know, maybe like a week or two before you need it, not having sit there for months and weeks. So that's another key learning. And, and, and the last one is really talking about the impact of whip on throughput and how you can have, you know, not just having the equipment, but then how much of it is going through the assembly line to the production process that is, shouldn't go, that is gonna start impacting cycle time and your throughput, if you will. So over the, over the journey, you know, we were able to reduce the lead time, you know, like it says, cycle time tremendously. And also very important, the delivery of the site improved, you know, dramatically from, you know, from in terms of going back to why are we doing all this is synchronize equipment to to sub to the demand of the construction site. So, you know, we wanted to make sure we have pretty high level of equipment available when it's needed to be able to do the work. So the first part of this up to now I've been talking about, you know, the craft work building of construction of data centers. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, we don't only build data center build, but we also data center from third party providers. So, so what this page is trying to show is, you know, how can you use production planning for knowledge work, right? So the situation is, you know, we have data center demand supported, like I say, by, by third party lease providers. In other words, we're not building it, but we're leasing data centers. So one of the challenges this is, you know, it's not the only challenge, but one of the things that we're trying to answer in terms of why are we doing this is, you know, how do you achieve predictable delivery of, you know, of a global capacity when you have a globally distributed third-party suppliers? In other words, how do you, can you have, you know, when you have this complex activity going on, how can you have a predictable supply demand? You know, when you have this demand that you know you can have a del consistent delivery as much as possible. So the answer, you know, you use production planning. You know, so you can, you have demand, should, you know, center process, but, you know, by developing, by using production planning, in other words, design the standard process of that, of those activities, of that knowledge work with timelines and durations and, and dependencies. And then you can begin to develop, deploy production planning, just like you would for the construction or, or any other activities. And then you can collect data and you start having more predictability. You understand what's going on with that production system. This is the, the third element that I talked about where you can do you know, model systems before production so you can understand how is the system behaving. This is something I uh, work with it with the SPS team. One of the questions that we were trying to understand is at which point do we have to be concerned about supply chain and why? You know, and then what can we do about it? So the first thing we had to do was, you know, with the with with the SPS team is, you know, build the model. That you know this the model on the top on the top left quadrant there, 
And so once we have that model, so that model has to represent the physical system, you know, has to say, this is, this is what that production system looks like, you know, here are what the key activities in that, in that, in that model. So once we've done that, then we can say, okay, what happens if I increase my demand by this or why if I increase this variability, how is the system behaving? In other words, what should I be paying attention to? And so what we learn, so the three, three learnings that I will start from the bottom left is that, you know, you can, you can increase your demand without having significant impact on your labor, on your workforce, up to a point though. You know, at some point you will see that there's gonna be a spike in, uh, in labor or crews, if you will, that you're gonna need when the capacity, so, you know, helps you understand how, you know, in terms of resource planning and allocation of workforce, how, how should you do that? You know, the, the quadrant in the middle, the graphics in the middle, is it's, it's about capacity utilization. What I'm showing is that in different processes that, that, that we consider, let's say for the specific model that we would design that is important to us, where, where should, when should we start worrying about utilization? So obviously all we wanna look at is the red and, and, um, and the pink, that's the area that we wanna worry about. So you can have a, a pretty complex production system, but by increasing your demand, not every aspect of the production system needs to, you need to be worrying about. Just focus on the area that you need to, to be paying attention to. So when you be, you're building a, a model, your system, you know, with your engineering team, your production system team, you know, over in real life, once you get going, you know exactly where the risk area is going to be, and you can be more ready, and you have a solution for that in mitigation, and you can move forward. And then the graphics on the right, the, the, the last one is showing you, you know, the impact of whip to cycle time or throughput. You know, at what point is whip no longer a value to you? I think Todd, Todd, you know, talked about it earlier, and he was saying, you know, and so that's really what what we're showing in here. Okay, so. In conclusion, you know, what's what's next for us? You know, I'm not trying to tell you here, I'm not here to say that we're wonderful, you know, things are going great. We're done learning, you know, that's not the point. So we're we're like I say, we're not necessarily at the beginning of this of this process. We are on, on this journey. You know, we're gonna continue optimizing, you know, we're gonna continue working. And like it says at the end, you know, opportunities abound. So with that, I will I will I will stop right here, Roberto. See if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Efren. Appreciate it. So maybe you can stop sharing your screen and it will be just you and I on, on video. So we can have through some discussions on, on the next 10, 12 minutes. There you go. So as we get questions through our audience, I do have some observations, I guess, from, from your message. And by the way, very, very impressive. And I'm glad to hear what, uh, what you guys are doing. The, let me ask you questions in, in because you show, you show us three different applications, right? I think you were very clear about it, right? The first one is associated with how you're synchronizing the supply of data center equipment with demand. The second one was the application of production planning and control to craft uh, knowledge work where you're doing with your lease program. And the last one you, you, were, you were talking about is the modeling and optimization of your production systems before you before these production systems actually materialize, right? And think you can make a, adjustments. So let me ask you a question about the first one. So, one thing that resonated to me is that what, what you guys were trying to first understand is the complexity, right? What are you dealing with? And, and the reason I'm, I'm making this comment, and perhaps you can please expand on it, is what was your experience, personal experience? We see a lot of organizations and teams actually going in the opposite direction. They know it's complex, but they don't want to acknowledge how complex it is, and they end up not being able to control what they do. So tell us more about how Microsoft went through that sort of process as a team. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like, you know, you know, I, it, um, it's, it's not an easy question to answer, let me put it this way. So let me think about it a little bit. 
you know, my background is manufacturing engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer, but a lot of years in manufacturing, industrial engineering, lean process, you know, work with Toyota production system and all of that. So, so my natural tendencies is, is to map, understand the process, right? Yeah, it is complex, but our job, you know, my, I always think like, our job is to, to, to simplify complexity, right? Not just say something is complex, therefore, you know, no sense touching it or whatever that may be, you know. So at Microsoft, I was given the opportunity, it, it is complex, but, you know, if you go to the, you know, just use production planning, production system, you know, go and map out the process and see, and see by understanding each process and how each process is connected, then maybe the complexity is still complex, but you begin to understand the system, you can start thinking about what, what is it, you know, what, what are the opportunities, what are the solutions, how we can go about it? I don't know if I'm answering your question, but you know, yeah. uh, you need to, you need to think of, you have to go back and, and, and get your hand dirty and understand what is it, you know, to make the complex less complex, if you will. Yeah. There's a, there's a question that the person in the audience is asking you is about, and let me, let me stay here in the, in the supply part of your message, right? And the question is about contractors or your suppliers, right? Are they heavily involved in the process? One comment you made is that, you know, Microsoft is not there to really do what they're supposed to do, but you wanted to get more control of your production system. So how has been that process of collaborating with your supply base? Not easy, right? I mean, nobody wants no, no, you know, you have to build a level of confidence, right? Like, like they say, Roma wasn't built overnight, so to speak, right? So with, with equipment manufacturers and suppliers, is it really having to explain to them, hey, like I said earlier, let's say you're a, a, a low voltage switch gear manufacturer or a generator manufacturer, you are the subject matter expert, right? You guys have a production system, you know what you're doing. You know, even if I know, like I said, I'm a lean manufacturing background, I'm not here to tell you how to do your business. This is, you know, so we, we set those boundaries very clearly you know, there may still be some apprehension in terms of, yeah, that's what you're saying, but you're Microsoft, but that the intent may be something else. But over time, you, you, you build that confidence. You basically have to preach. So at the beginning was just level setting, say, listen, we're not here to tell you how to do your business. We're not here trying to understand how you do things so we can get better understanding of your costs. What, what we are trying to do here is we want to understand, you know, let's say you're building, like I say, a generator, what are the critical aspects of that manufacturing process? What is the longest lead time? Because we want to understand when should and shouldn't we ask you to deliver this generator in a specific data center? And so it was a journey, some apprehension at the beginning, but I think in one of the picture where I showed deploy, like, you know, go to the, to the configuration, you know, some of the picture that you saw, that was myself, three people from SPS folks, into the manufacturing place of a specific supplier, you know, spending seven, eight hours in a day going to the manufacturing process and understanding that. So we had to build it over time. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. So maybe another question about lead time, because you mentioned, so your suppliers were giving you a lead time, right? And sort of you were asking me a question on, on your presentation. And, you know, one of the things that we typically look at is the lead time becomes a promise, right? From the person that is delivering something, right? But there's truly nothing, nothing scientific behind the definition of a lead time. However, as you start measuring the actual cycle times of what it really takes, what I think you mentioned, and please correct me and potentially expand on it, is you guys were able to clearly measure what was the actual time that it takes to deliver things from order to fulfillment, meaning to arrival to the site and being able to reduce these lead times, right? Did we yeah. get it right? Yeah. Great. And so can you say, can you tell us more about why, why reducing the lead times is so important to you, it's so important to Microsoft? What, what is that allowing you to do in your business? Yeah, so, I mean, with, if you have a predictable lead time, you can do better planning in terms of your production system, right? So if you know it's going to take X amount of months 
from from let's say in the construction from groundbreaking to where you want to receive a certain let, let's talk about the same generator i talked about you know let's say it's going to take x months right so so you want to make sure then if you understand the lead time of the, of the manufacturing process of the supplier then you can do better planning right you can also with better understanding of the lead time then you can partner with them right so they don't have to tell you like when you say lead time, you know, like you said earlier, you know, there is this gray zone that we don't know what that is, right? Can be weeks, months, but then you know, but you know, we can measure how long did it take from start of production by having production planning to for them to deliver, right? Let's say it takes X weeks, but if they say it takes let's say eight months, but we know four months of that is actual for production. So what is that six months? That's where we can have start having intelligent conversation with them. And I'm not saying that's all bad supplier giving you some inflated lead time because, you know, suppliers have a business to run. They have to have their own internal production planning. They have their own, they want to have their own internal capacity utilization, all of that, right? So the question is, if you have, if you partner with them in that six months, you can say, okay, we understand. So how about we give you a visibility of our demand earlier? then they can order the long lead time. So you can start solving the problem, right? That's why it's important to partner, understand the complex, to, like see, like you asked earlier. So you can have more intelligent conversation about a solutioning that is mutually beneficial. So it's important to us because now we can, it can, has impact on cash flow. When we can, cannot order equipment. It can, has impact on team member issue and purchase or all those stuff in the mind, in the sequence more are uh, you know sequence way so benefits are you know in multiple aspects excellent so we 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 have time for probably a couple more questions the next question is about your second example of application on the leases so it seems you mentioned knowledge work and knowledge work is very typical in engineering type of environments, right? Especially in this symposium where we have a lot of people coming from engineering and construction industry. So it seems that that application that you guys put in place, it's something that could be easily used also for engineering, even early design, right? It's knowledge work at the end, correct? Absolutely. It's a, it's a multi, multi-location, multi-network sort of production system, right? Now, tell us more about the last application you you brought to us today and this concept of modeling the production system. So perhaps you can share more about the, the, the learnings or details, you know, sort of down in the trenches, because that is a production system that Microsoft doesn't necessarily directly own, right? It's someone else's, right? Yeah. And so you, you mentioned the driver, why you did it, but maybe please expand on that a bit more. Yeah, so the, the production system that we shared that I showed on the, on the, on the graphics, is not our production system, it's a, it's a supplier production system. And it's a, a production system of a larger, more complex production system. So what we wanted to do was partner with Roberto and James. Uh, by the way, James, congratulations, I think well-deserved. It's, you know, it's a, you know, we wanted to focus on a certain aspect of the entire value stream process, if you will. And so, because, you know, we thought if, maybe this is the area that we need to stress test in our, in our model and our assumptions. And so with that, you know, we partner with a specific supplier, you know, again, it's always going back to the basic. It's, it's understanding that process. What does that process look like? What are the critical elements of that, of that entire process from beginning to end, you know, but, you know, understand the, the resources, the crews, you know, understand that, you know, the entire process, if you will. And then you can say, all right, you know, if we're gonna increase demand or introduce different levels of variability that inevitably we know it's gonna happen, right? So, so then we're, you know, should we worry about the entire process or should we worry about aspect of it? You know, maybe, maybe we'll understand maybe this specific supplier does not have, it's obviously they're learning from us. And so the output of it is like, they're like, oh yeah, of course. So we, the, here's how we're gonna mitigate A, B, C, D, things that the system is telling that we need to be paying attention to. But also we can also, we, I mean, Microsoft, we can say, okay, 
but maybe we need a, a secondary source as well, right? Or maybe can we also, we can say, is this, in terms of, I think Todd talked a little bit about design for manufacturability. Is this the ideal model for design for manufacturability of a process? Should we like, in other words, if we were to use another supplier or multiple suppliers, should we be saying to these suppliers, use this model because they know it works, it's optimized. So there's many things that you can do with it. Excellent, excellent. Really pleased uh, to hear, you know, the, the sort of journey that Microsoft has gone through and how little by little you have been expanding your perspective, always looking at production systems and, and modernizing the way you look at production, right? There's a difference between, you know, approaching your supply base, your contractors through the contracts versus what you are doing, which is shifting to the production. So, and I think that's a, that's a very important thing to, to highlight. So Efren, on behalf of PPI, thank you so much. We run out of time and thank you and extended thanks to the, to the Microsoft team behind you that uh, obviously there's a lot of people involved in this, not only you, and very impressive. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.